Testimony on the homelessness issues, and this is um, with us today are um, Ken Schatz, the commissioner, um, Jeff Pippinger is here for economic services in lieu of Sean Brown, Sarah Phillips is here, and um, Gus Selig and Jen Holler are here from BHCB. Um, so we have you listed, as commissioner, please join us. Thank you. Uh, for the record, my name is Ken Schatz. I'm the Commissioner of the Department for Children and Families. We do really appreciate the opportunity to, s to speak with you today about the programs and services that we have regarding homelessness. That's great. And I would just like to introduce the committee. There's a huge um, personnel changes that have happened um, since we last saw you. So um, I'll start. Tom Stevens uh, from Waterbury represent Waterbury, Huntington, Bolton, and Buells Gore. Um, Represent Byron. Uh, Matt Byron, Virgins. I represent uh, Ferrisburg, Kane, Virgins, and Walton, and Edison. Uh, Randall Zod, Barner, Comfort, Pucci, and West Park. <laughs> Marianne Delarge, Swanton, and Shelby from Franklin County District 4. Good. John Kalaki, South Burlington. Tommy Waltz, Perry City. <laughs> Mary Howard, Fretland 5 3. Chip Triano, Stannard. Ken and I go way back. <laughs> and Representative Long from New Fane also sits on this committee. Uh, Representative Gonzalez is the ranking member, and we have a vacant seat. So um, as we move forward, just to the folks in the room, uh, just to remember that a lot of us are uh, new. And so um, however we can translate lingo into English and acronyms into names, um, that would be great. We'll do our best. I appreciate that. It's always, uh, it is always a challenge, and I will say, as even as commissioner, that's sometimes a challenge for me. I have to stop and ask folks to explain what certain uh, acronyms mean. mean. Let me start, though, by sort of uh, giving regrets from Sean Brown, Deputy Commissioner of Economic Services Division. Jeffrey Pippinger will do a great job in representing the Economic Services Division, but um, Sean is actually testifying elsewhere in the building, so uh, he will certainly be available as time goes, goes on. So I'm just going to do a brief introduction because uh, Sarah and Jeffrey really have m much more knowledge than I about the programs. But I want you to know, in terms as commissioner, you know, we're committed uh, to really trying to address homelessness. Frankly, I'd love to be able to say we're going to eliminate it. Um, I don't think that's realistic in, in, in any short period of time. But really, we want to minimize the number of people who are homeless. We want to do what we can to prevent homelessness. We want to make sure that with respect to people who are homeless, that we provide supports and programs to enable them to move into more stable housing. Um, and we recognize, frankly, just how awful it is to be homeless. I mean, I think that I want you to know that we are appreciative of the, I look at data, but I think it's also important to recognize and I, that, that there are children, there are families, there are individuals who the, the, the traumatic experience of having unstable housing, being homeless, is incredibly difficult. So we do our best. We have an array of programs and services that you'll hear about, but at the end of the day, we are committed to trying to, to meet the needs of uh, those individuals, those children, those families um, who, are, who really um, have this difficult challenge in front of them. The point I want to make as commissioner is, and you'll hear specifically about our housing programs, but especially for those of you who, who are new to these roles. Um, the Department for Children and Families um, covers a, frankly, pretty wide swath in terms of populations and services and programs. So that the reality is issues of homelessness really affects our child welfare system in a major way. 
so many of the families who are involved in that system um, are, uh, are part of the, the barriers, part of the challenges they face are unstable housing. We have an Office of Child Support that really tries to enable non-custodial parents to pay their fair share to, to enable um, those parents who, who are single parents to raise their children have stable housing. We have a, a child care, the Children's Integrated Services Program, that also try to address the, the varied needs of families. And again, housing is such an incredible part of family stability that I just want you to know that all of those things really come together. And we work very hard uh, to address these uh, issues in, in major ways. I'm going to sort of, uh, sort of leave the chair and, and let um, Sarah and Jeffrey provide you with more tangible information about the services and, par and programs we provide. But I'll sort of leave by saying very clearly, none of us can address this alone. We work, and you'll hear about how we work with other agencies um, within uh, state government, including the Agency of Human Services. We work with other partners like Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, and we work with a tremendous array of community providers all over the state who are working very hard. We have a challenging issue here because homelessness um, continues to be a major uh, challenge and problem for many of the citizens in our state. So uh, I will leave and, and leave the chair for Sarah and Jeffrey, but please know that um, I'm available uh, and glad to answer questions as they come up uh, for you as we go forward. And we will see you, I'm sure, at some point, or part of your team on, on a larger general assistance description. I mean, we usually have some policy conversation about, about what's happening with GA and, and how it's used or how it's been used. Absolutely, and we're, I'm glad to be there. And again, Jeff Pippinger is the director of our general assistance program and is, um, also will be available to you as a committee to address any questions you have and we can look at uh, the ideas that we have uh, to try to improve that program. Thank, Thank you. you. Please join us, Sarah. For the record, my name is Jeffrey Pippinger. I'm the General and Emergency Assistance Program Director in Economic Services. Great. So it's good to be in front of you again. You heard from me this morning trying to provide a very brief overview of our homeless assistance landscape. Um, so there's going to be a little bit of repeat, but I'm hoping this is an opportunity to go a little deeper into some areas that we really quickly talked about. Um, so just as a reminder, as the Agency of Human Services actually administers more than 19 different housing programs across the whole agency uh, that provide support to community-based human service organizations. Uh, the work that happens, they're not all targeted towards homeless households, right? So some examples would be the Department for Mental Health has subsidy plus care. These are vouchers for folks who uh, would otherwise be in a psychiatric institution. Right, so it's to, to provide them with community-based housing and supports. Um, or we have uh, SASH, which is out of the Department for Aging and Independent Living, which provides um, service coordination, supportive housing for uh, seniors largely, um, folks on Medicare, to be able to remain um, in, in independent housing, affordable housing. Or through the Department of uh, Health, we have recovery housing. So there's a wide range of ways that the agency is looking at housing. Um, and I say all of that to say that we do have conversations within the agency around how the programs work together. Um, and we're going to today focus around Department for Children and Families programs that um, focus on homeless assistance specifically. So I talked about the Housing Opportunity Grant Program this morning, but I just want to sort of briefly talk about it a little bit more and exactly what we fund <laughs> through the HOP program. Uh, so the Housing Opportunity Grant Program uh, blends together uh, state funding and federal funding, some global commitment funding as well, uh, from a range of sources uh, to support community-based organizations, about 40 organizations across the state that are doing a variety of work around housing crisis interventions. HOP is the primary source of funding for emergency shelter and services around the state, so that's a really important uh, part of what we fund through HOP. 
That includes our year-round emergency shelters. It includes uh, seasonal or warming shelters. These are shelters that are only off open during the cold weather months. Uh, usually, off, uh, many of them are uh, through. You, I think you heard today through like Bethany Church in Mount Pillar that's supported with um, funds under the HOP program. It's actually supported supported with general assistance funds, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, HOP also supports um, homelessness prevention efforts, um, and I'll, I'll highlight a little bit of that and rapid rehousing, um, and it also provides funding for coordinated entry. Sarah, yep. just on the numbers that are in, in that box underneath yeah. the house, um, the 3872, where are those, are those numbers just from standard data collection from all the shelters? Yeah, this is numbers, these are, this is the number of people who stayed in publicly funded emergency shelters. We do have a couple shelters in the state that don't accept public funds. Um, so we don't collect that data. Um, so this is 3,872 people were sheltered during state fiscal year 2018. Um, of those people, 1,102 were children under the age of and, and are they unique or are they? Those are unique, yep. So they could have been set, they could stay several weeks or however long the process could take. Right, those are unique individuals. So this is just a little bit deeper look at the at HOP and sort of where funds go under HOP. So about, um, this is where I'm gonna pause for a moment and say, we, the General Assistance Program has funded emergency housing or motel vouchers when shelters are full. Right? So if shelters are full and there's no safe available shelter space for somebody, then they can access a motel voucher if they're eligible. Uh, and so we have, over the number of, um, of years, uh, very thoughtfully and intentionally uh, use general assistance funds to invest in community alternatives to motels because we think that those uh, programs uh, provide better service delivery and have better outcomes for families and individuals who are homeless. So we have invested those funds under the HOP program. So rather than you know, two different grant programs for shelters around the state, we have one, uh, one way that we put out funds for shelters and we do that under the HOP program. So um, that's in part why you see about 50% of the funds going for emergency shelter. Of this, yep. So uh, these are taken out of GA funds. Is that what you're saying? General assistance funds? So of the seven point, what I was just about to say is of oh, the 7.1, no, that's okay. You were, you were right with me. That's great. Of the 7.1 million that we invested under HOP, about 1.9 million was GA funding. Okay, so the individuals who are served are currently um, receiving general assistance, is that accurate to say? Or are they giving you J for the app? Okay, yeah. They would, we, so I'll talk about some of those projects, but an example would be the Bethany Warming Shelter in Montpelier. We saw our spending on general assistance emergency housing increasing exponentially in the Barry District or in the Washington County area. We had our shelter in Good Samaritan Haven in Barrie, um, and they even operated a seasonal warming shelter in Barrie at Heading, and those were consistently full. They just didn't have a place. And because those shelters beds were full, when they're full, we see more pressure on the motels, right? On, on the motel voucher program, GA. And so we very intentionally worked with um, the Barrie, or with, with Good Samaritan Haven, um, who worked on the ground with par partners in Montpelier, and Barry, and they opened up the Bethany Warming Shelter. And we used general assistance funds to open the warming shelter to provide additional shelter capacity so that those households, those individuals, could be served by the warming shelter instead of being in motels. So moving, I'm yeah. sorry. So if I can supplement that, just right. and, and, and same rules, same house rules. Please uh, identify yourself as Absolutely. You. Ken Schatz, uh, yeah. Commissioner of the Department for Children and Families. Sarah gave a great response in terms of programmatically, but I want to make sure that I take responsibility for decisions that I made so that you in the um, in legislation have given DCF some authority to provide some of the GA money that you have appropriated uh, to the department to use for programs to prevent homelessness and within the GA budget. So what we have done is transferred some of our GA appropriation over to OEO, as Sarah described, to support these shelters. We do not require people who go to these shelters to, to mm -hmm. go through the GA eligibility process. Yeah. We made the determination that as an approach to make sure that people have a warm shelter, 
They did not have to go through that process, but we felt it was appropriate to uh, support those shelters as a way of providing emergency housing. That's great. That's great clarification, Commissioner. But I mean, for to me, it's it's heartening to see that we can move resources to need, and that's the that's the message that I hear here. And it's um, it's in light. I mean, it's it's a good thing. <laughs> and just can um, homelessness one hundred and one or shelters one hundred and one? Could you just give us a quick definition of what low barrier, high barrier, no barrier shelters are? Because that's I think that's new vocabulary that we'll hear again and again, especially with the temporary shelters or the seasonal shelters. Sure. So, yes, I will. And then I'll come back to talking about the other things. From it. So emergency shelter, as I said this morning, is a sort of a broad term that we talk about. Um, there's a lot of ways that we provide emergency shelter for folks. So we have, this is, this is John Graham, right? And uh, uh, this is one of our year-round emergency shelters that provides shelter for families and individuals in Addison County. Um, and to be fair, we have a number of shelters like that across the state. We also have domestic and sexual violence shelters across the state that are there to serve victims fleeing domestic or sexual violence. And then we have, um, we also, we use motel rooms. Um, and to provide emergency shelter, we uh, sometimes are providing emergency shelter for families actually in apartments because that uh, is very normalizing for a family rather than putting 10 homeless families in one big building where they're all trying to share a kitchen. If we, um, we have some providers where we've given them some funds and they mass release an apartment and a family can be in there temporarily while they try and find other housing. And so that, that's a method that works well for families. And then we also have some seasonal warming shelters across the state. Um, these are shelters that uh, tend to uh, have what we sometimes refer to as low barrier or behavior based rules where, um, and, and to be fair, some of our year round shelters also operate this way, it's sort of a continuum, but where to get into shelter, um, it's easier to get into shelter. So if we need to provide a warm, safe place for someone to stay, we don't want to create the barrier, we don't want to put up a lot of walls to get to that warm, safe place, right? Because we need a warm, safe place so that people don't freeze to death outside. And so by behavior-based or low barrier, what we mean is that you don't necessarily have to be sober when you walk in the door. You need to be able to care for yourself and to behave well when you're inside the shelter. You're not allowed to drink or use when you're in the shelter, but you don't have to be sober when you're walking in the door necessarily. So that's one example of low barrier. Another example of low barrier might be shelters that allow animals to come in, right? You heard from someone this morning where that was a challenge around having an animal in shelter. And so that's another barrier, right, for people accessing shelter. And so we have some shelters around the state that are able to be more creative and flexible around animals. There's a lot of other barriers. And so when we think about warming shelters in particular, shelters that just operate in the cold weather months, um, who are really there just as the bottom safety net to provide a warm, safe place for folks and help them connect with other services. We want to make sure that, that it's really easy to access that shelter. And so our warming shelters tend to be the places where we're, we're supporting that. Uh, would that, would that uh, also include some, some churches? I know of one particular church in Burlington that has what I would call a warming shelter because they operate in the winter time and people are able to go between certain hours. Mm -hmm. I'm not clear on what the hours are and it seems to me that there's some organization that's in charge of yep. that yep. particular program. I think you're talking about Spectrum Youth. Spectrum. Yes, yes. Spectrum. So Spectrum has um, a youth emergency shelter, youth warming shelter. So this is a warming shelter. I think it operates at St. Joseph's. Yes, St. Joseph's okay. is where it, yep. yeah, that's And um, so they, right, and so Spectrum, the service provider um, mm -hmm. who operates mm -hmm. a year-round emergency shelter for youth, specifically operates the seasonal warming shelter for youth at, in the church. Um, and they, right, and that's exactly how they operate, in sort of a lower barrier approach, and, and their target population is really youth 18 to 24. Oh, I didn't know that, yeah. um, but, okay. So that's, that's, that's exactly yeah, an that's example. Yeah, that's good, because yeah. I've seen it, I've been there at times when um, people have been mm -hmm. coming in, and it's a separate part of the church, so it doesn't, yeah. doesn't involve being 
Yeah, I'm part of the church where services are. So, so, yeah. <coughs> So anyway, thank you. No, that's a great example. I would say, you know, and, and, and the Spectrum Shelter is, is an example of that. Our warming shelters, and some of our year-round shelters, but warming shelters specifically tend to close down during the daytime because they are operating in places like church basements or um, public facilities. And so there's a challenge of figuring out. It doesn't get magically warmer during the daytime hours, right? And so where do people go during the daytime to, to stay warm and safe and be able to move forward? Um, so that, that is a challenge that we experience. Um, so just to jump back for a second. So emergency shelter is a big piece of what HOP focuses on, but I don't want to lose sight of the fact that, you know, 22% of HOP funding is actually supporting homeless prevention activities. 16% is supporting um, housing services and rental assistance and security deposits and other financial assistance to help people get into permanent housing and be in permanent housing. We also support a little bit of funding for transitional housing for youth and veterans. Um, and then we have a chunk of funds that supports coordinated entry and some innovative approaches that communities are doing, like landlord liaisons I mentioned this morning. So I, I shared these charts again um, this morning. I shared these this morning around the number of persons in um, Vermont's publicly funded homeless shelters the number of children and then the length of stay. But I just put them in here again as sort of, I think, it's, um, Jeffrey's gonna talk about the general assistance program and motels and show you some data around motels, right? So part of the picture is who's staying in emergency shelters and part of the picture is who's not in emergency shelters, who's, who's in motels because we don't have space in emergency shelters. And understanding those two pieces together I think is important. So I just want you to, to see this piece. And I think um, in particular, and I said this this morning, but it looks like, oh great, the number of people in shelters is going down. But in fact, um, uh, the length of time that people are staying in shelter is going up dramatically. So um, the number of people who can serve in a shelter is limited, right? If you have 10 beds in a shelter and people are staying there longer, you serve less people overall. So just want to make that point. And just quickly, yeah. um, Diana, are you online? I am. Thank you for checking. All right. So <laughs> Diana Gonzalez has joined us via um, the phone. So Diana, when you have questions, just um, pipe up. Well, do I actually have a question uh, for Sarah, if I may? Please do. Um, Sarah, did you crunch the numbers on um, bed stays? Um, just wondering, kind of, with that toggle between increased number of days that people are staying, um, uh, and if, if that's something that you look at, so how many bed nights there are being served? Yeah, I. I Yes, totally. It does make sense. And we do have that. And um, I think you have a link to our, we do an annual report on the Housing Opportunity Grant Program that shows a lot more information around how we look at results in that program, not just shelter utilization data. Um, and we do, but we do look at bed nights. I didn't put that in here, but bed nights is essentially the number is one person in one bed for one night. So um, we can total that up for the year. We saw our Bed nights was um, very high, very high this year. And our number of people was lower, and that's, you know, the average length of stay is reflected in that. So. Did that answer your question? It does, thank you. And, and again, these numbers are statewide, so, I mean, when, when we, at some point, we'll see a breakout <coughs> of what the seasonal shelter usage is going to be. We usually come in share what, what's been going on since November 1st or whatever. Sure, we can come back in and share some of that. Yeah, because it's so, it's weighted so differently, you know, Burlington gets the biggest numbers and yet they say, we save more money in Burlington because of the quality of the programs or shelters or whatever, and, and it's different in Central Vermont or Northwestern mm -hmm. or anywhere. so just. Yeah, I, I think it's an important point is that the, the problem, the problem of homelessness is inherently local, right? And so our solutions have to be really locally driven. I think about a third of our population of people experiencing homelessness are in Chittenden County. So it does tend to seem like it gets all the resources. It doesn't get all the resources. I want to assure you that we look very closely at the distribution of resources and need across the state. Um, but, 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 so yes, we can certainly come back and share more information around warming shelters and provide you a, a better update around that. 
And then also, you know, we see it's inherently local in the sense that, um, you know, like I said, in Washington County, we saw those numbers ballooning and so we needed to respond locally in Washington County. And we also needed to look closely at like, well, well, not just the numbers is, is ballooning, but, but who amongst the population um, do we, what's the right intervention? Because a warming shelter is not gonna be a place for families. If, it's, if families, if the number of people, mm -hmm. families experiencing homelessness is, is what's driving up the numbers of GA motels, then we need to respond differently than with a warming shelter. We don't wanna put families in a church basement that they have to leave at 7 a.m. in the morning and come back at eight o'clock at night, right? sleeping on cots, like that's, this, we're just not gonna intervene in the same way. So, so yes, so it's inherently local, but we do look with our community partners very closely at well, who's homeless in your community and what problem, what exactly what problem are we trying to address? I'm gonna turn it over to Jeffrey to talk more about the GA program specifically. So again, uh, I'm Jeffrey Pippinger, the General and Emergency Assistance Program Director. Uh, General and Emergency Assistance, often referred to as GA. Can I do that? GA. Um, now you can. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Just Just has been defined and used. Yes. Excellent. So, um, the GA program, uh, it's the, essentially the, the program of last resort for the state. Um, the statutory authority says that um, it's supposed to provide for the necessities of life in the event that there's not a program uh, within DCF that can otherwise do so. Um, for the purposes of this conversation, we'll be talking about emergency housing, but I just wanted to put a reminder out there that emergency housing is this much of a program that's this big, but that much of a program often takes up most of the conversation. Uh, I'm happy to talk about the other parts of the program at some point if uh, folks are interested in that as well. So, um, for the purposes of shelter, uh, we provide uh, emergency housing in a motel when no alternative to shelter is available. So we have a shelter first policy. If there's shelter available, we would direct people there. Uh, in the event that there is no shelter or shelter is full, then we would house folks in uh, a motel. Eligibility for the program is determined in the district offices or by 211 after hours and on weekends and on holidays. Uh, it is a, it's an extremely complicated program. For the purposes of simplicity, there are three primary ways through which somebody might be able to access emergency housing. There's uh, catastrophic eligibility, there's vulnerable, vulnerable population, and then adverse weather conditions. The way the program is set up currently uh, in its incarnation, it's categorical eligibility first. You have to meet a category of need, and then we will look at resources and financial eligibility second. Uh, so catastrophic eligibility would be folks who are um, uh, fleeing uh, domestic or sexual violence, uh, constructive eviction, court-ordered eviction, or fire, flood, natural disaster. That's up to 84 days of housing in a motel. We don't give 84 days at a pop, but it's a maximum of 84 days. Vulnerable population is a maximum of 28 days. And those would be folks who are in receipt of Social Security disability, uh, pregnancy in the third trimester, children under six, um, uh, older Vermonters. We also have a, a point system which kind of catch all if you do not meet any of those other, which has to do with uh, the medical facility recently, a medical facility, for example, or being a veteran, you might get a point. Then there's adverse weather conditions. Adverse weather conditions is what used to be known as the cold weather exception. Uh, before that was changed several sessions ago. Um, essentially, that means that at the commission's discretion, we will relax uh, eligibility criteria for Vermonters seeking emergency housing. Uh, that would be if there's a greater than 50% chance of precipitation and it's less than 32 degrees, or an ambient or wind chill temperature of less than 20 degrees. So we have um, a series of slides that are about data, and I'm happy to spend as little time or as most more time as you'd like on this, but essentially um, these first two um, uh, slides will just show the, uh, the count of households served as well as the length of uh, stay, the number of days. And you can see that over time, since 2012, 2013, uh, that has trended down. Um, with a couple of uh, 
bumps along the way. But generally speaking, there's been a long-term trend of a decrease of those numbers. Um, for well, except for that 2012-2013 right. spike, was that, so that, that was a bad year, but why? 2013 was the institution of the cold weather exception, unless, unless I'm misremembering that. But I believe that that's when um, that uh, exception of the rules was first uh, instituted, so we saw a spike in the organization. Uh, 2015 would be when we uh, began, uh, the summer of 2015 is when we began the uh, initiative to switch to community investments to motels. Um, so part of the trend down may be attributed in part to our uh, shifting from motels to community investments as well. And, I know, I know I, the, only, the other thing I would add is that when you're looking at the, the data over time for the emergency housing program, one of the things to keep in mind is that it's a crisis program, it's a catastrophic program. So uh, it, it's hard to predict crisis, but also whether or not it was exceptionally cold winter, like 2015 was the polar vortex, um, or if it was much warmer winter, uh, you'll see things uh, dip down. So what we also did for you today was to look uh, to provide some information um, of, uh, regarding our unduplicated utilization currently, looking at fiscal year 19 um, relative to fiscal years 18 and 17 during the same period of time, so July 1st through November. Um, and what we've seen, uh, uh, as you can see in this table, is that um, we're seeing a substantial uptick this year relative to previous years for this period of time. Um, the household utilization is up about 8% from fiscal year 18 and up about 24% from fiscal year 17. I would say that um, that in and of itself uh, raises some flags for us, but the, the number of nights that far right hand column, that's where we start to get really concerned about the, the shift because this year we're seeing um, an increased number of nights that's up about 35% from last year and 47% relative to fiscal year 17. And we're only partway through the year, so we'll see what that, uh, how that shakes out in the end. But also remember that the adverse weather conditions did not go into effect until November 1st. And our first night was about midway through that now, can, can you go back one slide there? So, again, how do we read, you know, how, how do you, did you code the people who come into the system so that you know why they're in a crisis mode or they're, that they're utilizing services so that we know that it's a temporary or a chronic or, a, you know, whatever dozen possible categories they might fit in? Yes, so this is the this is the really boiled down version of it. Yeah. Um, I actually have a lot more data that's broken out by category. I'm happy to share that, or I can circulate it. That's fine. Um, yeah. Okay. But, uh, but we have that broken down by um, category of eligibility as well as uh, subcategory. And do those classifications give you any clues as to why the number of how underduplicated households are growing, or why the number of nights are growing? Uh, they start to. I would say that they don't necessarily give an entire picture. Uh, I would say that one of the things you'll see is that since uh, even just from a 20,000 foot level, it, the fact that we have unduplicated household utilization, those could be households with or without children, um, we see that number going up, but the, the stay is going up, the number of nights is going up much faster. So what we do know, and this is, that is corroborated with the is that the folks who are being housed under catastrophic circumstances, the DV, court order, constructive eviction, and we rarely see the fire, flood, natural disaster anymore. Uh, but those three, we see that increasing. Um, uh, so it's really that the length of stay is being bumped out. Does that answer your question, please? Um, and we also wanted to provide you with just a snapshot of what uh, it has looked like in terms of adverse weather conditions um, over time. So this is, say, fiscal years 14 through 18. Uh, with the number of nights that have been called, the number of physical nights that have been called, the um, 
number of applications that had been granted, the breakout of adults and children, and then the cost uh, associated with that. Again, 2015 was the polar vortex. You might remember 16 was a much warmer winter. Um, and then 17 and 18 were, as I recall, much steadier. Yes. So using this chart, mm -hmm. and going from 1.8 to 344, if I'm a budgeter, I'm like, woo, that's great. But how do you approach going into each season each of these, each of these situations. I mean, this is GA. This is, this is emergency money. You don't know what the emergency is going to be. But I'm looking at this going. Uh, uh, did we save money or did we spend less? I, I feel the same way. <laughs> no. That being said, that being said, um, I would also point out that I should have said that 16 was the first winter that we had the community investment. So the seasonal shelter in Burlington, for example, which has done a tremendous amount of work in that community. Um, and then 17, I believe, is when uh, most of the uh, DE partner initiatives came online, which I'll talk about in a second. Which, if I may, Ken chats again. Uh, this is part of my challenge, is, is, it sort of relates to the budget process. As you all know, th those connections are there. So we do the best we can to come up with a budget, knowing that we have no way of knowing in advance what the weather conditions are going to be like. So that's part of our challenge. It's sometimes why you see us come back in the budget adjustment um, phase of the, of the appropriations process. But even then, if you think about it, we're only in the middle of the winter, and we have to submit our budget adjustment scenarios in September. So it is part of our challenge to close out. But hopefully, what we've done, as, as uh, Jeffrey and Sarah have talked about, is by putting more money in these community investments, in, at least in terms of shelters, and that's aside from the work that VHCB and other entities have done to create more, more affordable housing units. We hope we can manage um, these needs uh, to the best of our ability. We try to plan. But honestly, it's, it's uh, a bit of a guessing game. We, as you can see from the chart that Jeffrey showed you, those numbers do go up and down. And so we're, you know, that, that's just um, part of the dilemma we face in terms of trying to plan these programs. But we're committed to the approach of providing these community investments in, in, in terms of shelters and other programs to try to do as much as we can to avoid uh, people having to uh, utilize um, the motels at any time of year, but particularly when it's extremely cold. And, and quickly, just for the benefit of us all, really, is just to say, prior, you keep saying prior to the use of community investments, so up until then there was an well, what got eventually interpreted as an over-reliance on using motels and hotels, especially in the all-weather um, exemptions, where um, it, it, it just to, if you get a quick primer on 28 days, 84 days, you know, just the just how we use those and why we switched to the. I mean, you're going to go into the community investments in a second, so. Yeah, so I would, uh, and let me know if I don't answer that question. But so the community investments really, it's about kind of. Um, a, a couple of things. Uh, number one, how can we use those dollars in a, in a more effective, more efficient way? But it's also about connecting people with services because in a motel room, you have a motel key. And, and there are things that folks have to do to continue to maintain eligibility for general assistance, but you are at a motel with, in a, with your key, as opposed to if we're sending you to a seasonal shelter um, or uh, an investment run by one of the uh, domestic violence agencies where there's a, different set of services and connection right away. Um, and the cost for the motel rooms average over eighty dollars a night. So and this wasn't the capital plaza. Correct. So we're our statewide average is about seventy six dollars currently uh, for motels. Um, statewide that ranges anywhere from uh, Harbor Place, uh, which is significantly lower than the market rate, up to um, you know over a hundred dollars a night, depending on location. Some districts we have one motel, some districts we have six, seven, eight. Uh, as far as the community investments are concerned, uh, I would say a couple of things. Sarah's already touched on this, but I would reiterate the fact that where we have seen a good deal of success um, and some really interesting innovation is around seasonal shelter uh, and also around 
there are three domestic violence organizations in the southern part of the state who have taken over the DV motel pool for the state. So they have expanded shelter capacity as well as them operating the motel pool. And I can tell you that they're, they've negotiated lower rates than uh, I think they are statewide averages. Um, and their length of stay is much shorter uh, than ours. So I'll give an example of that just to make it more clear. So like in Rutland, uh, uh, New Story, uh, is the domestic violence shelter. And uh, they were always full. And so we were regularly putting, oh, the state was regularly putting a lot of victims fleeing domestic violence into motels in Rutland County, a lot spending a lot of money in Rutland County on per DV motels. Uh, we approached New Story and said, hey, what if we were able to grant you some funds and you could instead, when your shelter was full, you could place <coughs> folks in motels, but then when the shelter had a space that opened up, you could bring them back into the motel. And also, even, or back in the shelter, and also you were placing them in a motel and you would be regularly <coughs> meeting with them. So in other words, there was that service and they, uh, they were glad and willing partners in that investment, and it significantly decreased the amount of money that we were spending on. We still have a lot of domestic violence victims in Rutland County in motels, but now it's really just all for a new story, and they are really the right provider to be meeting with those families and providing services. So, um, and we're spending significantly less on motels than we otherwise would be. So. Because we also want them to connect with New Story on night one, not on night 84. Uh, um, I'm curious, did anything ever become of the uh, warming shelter proposal in Bretland? Right, so we had for uh, a number of years uh, worked with community partners in the Rutland um, area to see whether or not we could create some additional shelter capacity in Rutland because we um, just don't have enough. And in particular for single adults in, in the cold weather months, and we identified that as a, as a need. We did have a one-time funding appropriation that the legislature gave us specifically for Rutland to create seasonal capacity for, uh, for adults in Rutland. And we, uh, there were, a lot of different ideas uh, put forward, but none of them were able to get traction. Um, we haven't given up hope, and I think there's still, Rutland is area is still um, very much on our minds in terms of trying to address homelessness in Rutland. It, it is one of sort of our hot spots in terms of spending on motels, and um, I think, I hope anyway, that our friends at VHCD might talk a little bit about um, some projects and development in the Rutland area around permanent housing, which, which ultimately we're talking about how you address the crisis need, but you really end homelessness with housing. So um, we're really supportive of the efforts that the VHCB is doing to, to promote housing projects for the homeless in the Rowan now. I would say one last comment on community investments before we move on, because there's plenty more to, to share, but um, would be that um, an important, I, what I, one thing that I think is a critical component of community investment is that it's a community investment. So what we're saying is we're going to communities around the state saying, what are your needs? What have you identified as a community as, a, as something that might help or that you are a resource that you need that is not existing or what can be more expanded? So because what works in Brattleboro doesn't necessarily work in Newport and what works in Barrie might not work in Middlebury. So I just wanted to, to name that, that that is kind of a, uh, it's an important distinction that we're asking communities to, to have that conversation with us. And our most recent GA investment is, um, is in Loyal County, where a group of, um, really an interfaith group that has for a long time identified the need for any shelter capacity in Loyal County came together last year and sort of had a rotating churches offering, and synagogues, I shouldn't just say churches, offering shelter overnight. They realized that rotating spaces, facilities night to night was really hard for people, and they worked to identify a facility they could use regularly, and with the Lamoille County Sheriff's Office, um, of all things, who had a building available and um, in Hyde Park, and they've been operating in, in Morrisville in sort of a space that someone gave them, but they're moving into Hyde Park, and uh, I think next week even, and they're excited to be in their sort of more more permanent space. And they're going to be offering, well, it's 12 beds of warming shelter for uh, uh, 
uh, for adults in, uh, in Lemoyle County. And that was an investment that we made with general systems funds. And so this is the chart really that shows, before we move on from investments, that just shows uh, the green is how much was spent directly on, on motels, emergency housing, and the purple is how much of GA funds was spent on community investments. So you can see sort of the trend over time we've spent, we've invested more GA funds in, in community-based projects. And do those, and I'm sorry, I know you're gonna answer this question. No, I, I was gonna move on, so. No, no, I know you're gonna answer that one question. Okay, all right, great. Uh, so, in addition to the motel voucher program, uh, another um, uh, intervention that we have in economic services is the Vermont Rental <coughs> Subsidy Program uh, that was begun in 2011. Uh, it's a rapid rehousing initiative. This is a housing first model. Uh, the fact that uh, the, the thought that we might be able to take folks who are experiencing homelessness and put them in a rental situation with subsidy uh, to get them a, a deal of st uh, a good deal of st stability. Um, so uh, $1 million is the lead the, for the VRS, and almost all of that goes towards subsidy. Um, the uh, eligible participants have to meet the AHS definition of homelessness. They're paired with a housing support worker. Those might be, it might be a reach-up case manager. It might be a contracted case manager. It might be a community <coughs> partner. Um, and that's to make sure that folks have the supports um, that are necessary to su succeed as a tenant during the course of their um, subsidy, which should be up to 12 months. Uh, participants contribute 30% of their income. So as their income increases uh, over the course of the program, their contribution would increase as well. Uh, and the thought is that this program really should bridge people to a long-term uh, stability solution, whether that's a uh, Section 8 voucher. There's a uh, VRS preference for uh, housing choice vouchers um, through the Vermont State Housing Authority. Or perhaps it might be a project-based situation, or also uh, increased income. And currently, um, these numbers are much smaller than the hotels, but we have 45 active participants, 24 tentatively granted participants. Those are folks who are approved, they're eligible for the subsidy, and we have said yes, you can receive this, and they're looking for suitable housing. Uh, the right number of bedrooms, something that passes the housing inspection, uh, and uh, also within the Vermont State Housing Authority payment standards. Um, you'll see that there's an asterisk there, and that's because I'm just putting out for comment the fact that we're having, we've seen trouble this year, this year so far with tentatively granted participants, people who have that subsidy in hand, finding affordable housing that meets their needs at the, uh, at the, at really at a, at a cost that they can really afford. And that is statewide, that is not particular to one geographic region. And that's a, that what they can afford is what their 30% would be. So if you, I mean, if, if there was an apartment for $600 that would use this, this voucher, then, then they might be able to afford that 30%, $180 or whatever it would be. But if they only can find a $1,200 a month apartment, 30% is 360. Yeah, I mean, just whatever the numbers are. I mean, just is that yeah, how you. Just to meet the, this, this, the Vermont State Housing Authority payment standards. I can get those to the community if that would be helpful. Um, but that's a, a pegged number. Okay. Um, so if you're looking at a one bedroom, a two bedroom, a three bedroom, yeah. yeah. Chittenden County for the balance of state, it has to be under a certain dollar amount, which um, is escaping me at this moment. So, but is that the problem that people can't find? Housing at the state level? The state it, level? Yes, yeah. that is a it's, problem. It is, it, yes. It's one of many problems, but yes. It is It is a problem that we've zeroed in on, and, and we have some other experts in the room who can speak about this more generally. But essentially, um, HUD, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, sets what's called fair market rents. Um, and that impacts, um, uh, it says, this is what, uh, it's not even what the average rent is in a community. And sort of a convoluted way that they get to this number, and it's particularly problematic how they get to it in small rural communities, which is why we have trouble with the fair market rent standard in Vermont. Um, and they essentially say, if you have a Section 8 voucher, uh, a housing choice voucher, 
Um, this is, you can, and you have the voucher and you're looking for an apartment, you can get an apartment that's two bedroom, but it has to be, the rent on the apartment has to be at this standard or less, right? And so it's hard then to go out in the community and find apartments that are less at or less than that payment standard. Now, housing authorities have a little bit of flexibility, which is why it's called the payment standard, but essentially it's a fair market rent is sort of caps the amount of the, um, the rent of the apartment that you're looking for, and it's challenging. So we know that a lot of our rents in Vermont are just above the fair market rent standard. Um, and Vermont Rental Subsidy uses that standard because folks can bridge from the Vermont Rental Subsidy to the State Housing Authority Section 8. So in order to, to bridge from the temporary one-year subsidy to the Housing Choice Voucher, the Section 8 voucher, they need to meet all of the Section 8 requirements in order to stay in that same apartment. So that's the challenge there. We do have some flexibility with funds that are just purely state general funds that don't necessarily need to meet the fair market rent standard. But that, that is a specific issue that um, we've zeroed in on and there's, um, I would defer to my colleagues on the right if you wanted to learn more about how we're addressing that. I'll just brief because Sarah did a great job of eloquently describing the problem, but from my perspective, you should you should know this backup, this has caused a backup in DCF's temporary housing programs. So that when because that's our role. And and so the reality is if, if we have folks in Vermont Rental Subsidy, the idea is, as Jeffrey described, it's a bridge program. And the idea being that hopefully we can work with them within a year to move on to more sustainable permanent housing. If they can't find housing they can afford we've got a problem because they're staying in Vermont Rental Subsidy Program longer than anticipated, which means we can't bring new people into the program, um, and that's a problem. Similarly, with respect to the issues that Jeffrey described regarding motels, um, that's <coughs> some of the reason why those length of stay, and also it's the shelter programs, as Sarah has or will describe, people are staying longer in those programs for temporary housing because they can't move on, and that, is definitely a challenge we all need to do our best to address. And committee, this may seem like 201 or 301 or whatever on these voucher stuff, it'll come crystal clear in about six months. So <laughs> um, as you get used to it, there's a lot of terminology being thrown out. You know, there's, there's no quiz on it, but it's this it, There's a lot of resources here that are being used and they're trying, they're just, it, it's not a simple, this voucher issue or this housing issue is just, so many pieces that we're just yeah. starting to, to cover. Right. Uh, two, yeah. two quick points before I turn it back over to Sarah. Uh, one is that um, when we say tentatively granted, folks have, if, if you've been tentatively granted for a Vermont rental subsidy, you have 60 days to find a place. And what we've been seeing this year is folks maxing out that 60 days and then coming back and asking for the 30 day extension, which is also, you know, you know, which is part of the program and still having trouble. So getting to the end of 90 days and kind of really being on the edge of whether they can find a place for this. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that I would mention is that it's, um, as that previous slide indicated, about 88% of the Vermont rental subsidy participants are reach up here. Um, quick question on that point. Do you think well, what's a bigger barrier, um, inventory or market price for both? Yes. Yes to both. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I'm not being flip. I no, 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 no. Yeah. And different communities have different degrees of that shout out. Again, I would defer to Okay. I, I'll, I'll just jump in. It's not really on the slide, but I'll say one of the things is working, right? Because we just told you about a lot of things that aren't working, but I just want to highlight something that is working. So we have, um, through under HOP, uh, where we sort of uh, do some innovative investments. We have invested in landlord liaison. I mentioned that sort of briefly this morning in four communities. And I'll, I'll highlight Rutland again, not because I'm picking on you, but because I think Rutland, the landlord liaison has done an amazing job at the Homeless Prevention Center. This is a position where her sort of entire job is to do outreach to landlords and to help them understand uh, uh, the clients they may be accepting through the program and to explain the commitment that the Homeless Prevention Center is making and when you can call us and to be available anytime a landlord needs to call someone because there might be something going on 
Uh, they have some risk pool funds that they put up, so this is like a pool of money they have on the side that say, hey, you're gonna house our client. We know they have sort of a rough history. They're on a good path now, we're working with them, and if something goes wrong, we're gonna be able to step in and help you uh, with whatever went wrong. And to be fair, they rarely use those housing mitigation funds, but just having them available sometimes can make a landlord willing to take a chance on somebody. And so, um, so I think this is a great example where they have, this is, they've been able to, where otherwise families and individuals who are homeless have a lot of housing barriers, right? Sometimes it's criminal record, sometimes it's bad or no rental history at all, uh, minimal income, which we're helping with, you know, rental assistance programs. Um, other behavioral challenges going on. And so it can be hard to get an apartment when you got that all stacked up against you and, and you're trying to find a second chance, right? And so the landlord liaison has really been helpful in terms of getting units even in the, in the private market available to clients. Because when you have a really low vacancy rate and I'm a landlord and I can choose between this person who has a great rental history or this person who doesn't have a great rental history, I'm gonna take the person who has a good rental history. But if I might take this other client if I know that the rent's going to be guaranteed because the organization's going to be paying it, and I know that um, there's going to be a housing support worker in there every month or every week, and I know that if something goes wrong, they're going to be there to help me out financially. Um, and so, hey, that sounds like a great deal. And so that's made a real difference. It's been a game changer for us in terms of being able to more quickly house people. And I would say, I would just piggyback and say that where we have, I, you know, I said it was a statewide problem, right? Almost entirely a statewide problem. Some place where we've seen a lot of success this year, this fiscal year, with VRS lease ups with those tentatively rent books is Barry. And Barry has a landlord liaison. Representative Kamash, and just before you ask a question, I just want how are uh, we're interrupting you a lot, so how are we on the material that you prepared? Because we do have other folks here too. I think we're I think we're pretty good. Okay. Yeah. We can move it along faster too. Okay. Representative Kamash. So the program you're just describing in terms of the liaisons, is that the only one I'm familiar with, <clears throat> and I'll go back in time three years, is Pathways Housing. Is that what you, is the program that they had, or had, I know they had it at that time, is that basically what you're describing? So Pathways uses a similar design in their programming. So they, um, Pathways Vermont, which is a, a nonprofit organization, right. um, provides supportive housing for people who are homeless. And they uh, they have funding to pr provide funding for a housing support worker who works directly with the client. And then they have a separate staff person who acts more as a liaison with a landlord. I don't think they call it a landlord liaison, but essentially within their program, they, they use that same model. And it's a very good model. We don't fund pathways to do that work uh, specifically. But that model but works. Yes, we think it does. It does work. Great. So if that's the direction that all of this is going, I think it's a worthwhile investment. And I think you would get a lot more um, owners to participate and to be willing to take a chance because there is that backup. Because that's the problem that um, landlords face when they do take someone in because everything looks reasonable um, and then something happens and the whole thing goes south mm -hmm. and then they're left with cleanup mm -hmm. so to speak this the way in which pathways works i know um alleviates that mm -hmm. yeah i think it is a good model yep i agree um so i just want to i think there's a um this year in particular <laughs> Um, Vermont Legal Aid has re released their eviction prevention report. Uh, the Vermont Council on Homelessness, which is the interagency council um, in government and community partners and um, uh, other statewide partners, housing partners, participate in the Vermont Council on Homelessness. And we have been having a specific focus in the council this year around eviction and homelessness prevention. So I just want to highlight a little bit sort of, of um, how we approach homelessness prevention at the agency as well. So HOP funds do provide some funding for homelessness prevention, but sort of broadly, um, not everyone who's evicted becomes homeless. 
Uh, not everyone, although eviction in itself has a lot of significant costs for families and individuals and communities and landlords. Um, not everyone who's participating in a homeless prevention program is facing eviction, right? So these are also households that may be uh, staying with other friends or family or moving around a lot, we sometimes call that couch surfing. Um, and we don't necessarily think of those households as being sort of literally homeless. They're not hitting our shelter system, they're not hitting our motels, but they're sort of on the verge of homelessness, right? Um, and so we have a lot, we do have resources available to support um, folks with homelessness prevention. And a lot of times homelessness prevention efforts is as much about connecting people to financial coaching and counseling, um, renter one-on-one -on -one classes, um, faith-based providers are a big part of our homeless prevention system. And we do have some really limited public funding under HOP that specifically supports rental arrears, um, moving help security deposit and rental assistance in homelessness prevention cases. I'm not gonna go through this slide in particular, but it's a whole bunch of other ways that you can think of sort of more upstream homelessness prevention efforts that are really important. You know, when you think of like transitional housing or re-entry folks coming out of corrections, right? That's a homelessness prevention effort, right? Um, that's putting, helping folks coming out of corrections have some housing, have some stable housing, and not just kind of hit the streets or hit GA or hit um, our emergency shelters, and they have some housing so they're getting back on their feet. So these are all a really important sort of big picture way that we think about homelessness prevention. Um, I do want to just highlight for you, under HOP, I talked about about 22% of our funds under HOP actually go towards prevention and thinking about what that means. Um, we provide services, what we call broadly housing relocation and stabilization services, what a very long journey term. But in other words, housing support services for people who are either at risk of homelessness or, or experiencing homelessness. This past year, of those service, those service providers in your community, you heard from um, the SEPTA housing support caseworker, right? She does both of those things. She works with people on the verge of homelessness and she works with people who are homeless. And at any given point in time, her caseload is kind of shifting. Right, Who, what's the need in my community? And this past year, all of the folks like Susan across the whole state that were doing that kind of work, 71% of their time was spent focused on um, prevention clients versus rapid rehousing or versus rehousing clients. Um, that's a shift. Uh, the year before it was more like 50-50 and sort of the look, our look back is that it's been more 50-50, but there's been more of a shift in their time focusing on prevention. Um, and we served under HOP, we had 1,500 households that we served with prevention. You'll hear Jessica Radford rattle off this number, Jessica Radford from Vermont Legal Aid rattle off a number. $367,000 was spent on rental arrears. This is where she got that number from. So of the funds um, under HOP that actually were dollars that went in to pay for client financial assistance or rental assistance, not the, not the support worker, um, we spent over 500,000 on prevention uh, and um, 367,000 there was for rental assistance, which is, in the case of prevention is usually rental arrears. And then I just wanna highlight briefly for you family supported housing. Um, family support, you, heard, you may have heard Ted Brady sort of do a shout out around family supported housing, but this is um, intensive home-based community um, seven community providers across the state providing intensive home-based case management and service coordination for families with really complex high needs. Uh, we have seven providers in seven districts. Um, we serve about 155 families. It's a small-scale program. Um, here's a list of the providers. These are families who are experiencing homelessness. They enroll in the program. They're families that have multiple episodes of homelessness, have very young kids, are involved, child welfare or family services or DCF and uh, they enroll in this program. Family supportive housing providers help place them in housing through partnerships with affordable housing providers um, and, uh, and sometimes with a voucher as well. And then they provide long-term ongoing support services that are home-based to help them stay in that housing. Um, we actually use Medicaid funding um, to support family supportive housing. <coughs> which is something we did in 2016 that allowed us to expand from uh, five districts to seven. Um, it's just a little bit more about what the focus of the program is. Um, Caseloads are just 12 to 15 families, which really allows for some intensive support services. 
uses a two-generation approach, which is really both working with parents and kids within the household. Um, and we focus on personal finance with families because we know there's an underlying financial component to the goals that families have. So focusing on budgeting and saving and spending um, with families. I mentioned that already. I'll just say that we have about 155 families. Last year we served um, 147. Um, I mentioned coordinated entry this morning and I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on that other than to highlight for you that as a system of care we have been working really hard in the past few years to work better and smarter. Um, and I think that we, uh, we need to keep doing that but coordinated entry is really about um, getting people quickly connected to housing help making sure that if I'm homeless, I don't have to knock on six or seven different doors. I can knock on one door, and you know how to get me connected. Um, so coordinated entry doesn't put more resources into providing housing or services, but it sort of is the way that we do work in our communities, and we agree to all work together so that if I knock on this door, you know how to get me connected so that that point A of being identified to point B of getting in housing is shortened. Um, it also is the way that we're sort of across the board assessing needs of households, doing housing assessment with every household in the same way. So that um, if you go to one provider, they say, oh, you need this housing. You go to a different provider, they say, oh, you need this kind of housing. We want to sort of be more collective in our approach to understanding what housing intervention is going to be right for a family and matching them to the right intervention as opposed to just come first come first serve. So Vermont rental subsidy is not right for every family, right? It's only going to be right for some families because it's time limited and the rental assistance is going to end. Some families are going to need family supportive housing, which is much more intensive. But that's a higher cost intervention and that's not going to be right for every family. So we got to get better at matching people to the right intervention and that's what coordinated entry is really helping us do. So I want you to know that as a system of care, we're really focused on doing it better. Uh, I'd like to ask you a question. That was a great slide because I just wanted nope. the question. Okay, great. I'll go back. Dealing with that. Yeah, I mean, you heard testimony this morning from a couple of people who have been homeless. And it's a reminder that often the homeless have no clue where to go. And, you know, and I'm, so I'm glad to, to hear you talking about you can knock on one door and it opens essentially many doors. Now, what about the people that don't even know there's a door to knock on? Yeah. How do you reach them? Yeah. It's a really good question, and we do, uh, our, you know, we have providers around the state who do outreach. I think you may have heard from Renee Weeks this morning talking about working with Hartford Police Department to actually go out right. um, and into folks camping in the woods and make sure they knew how to get connected. So that's one example of outreach. Um, you know, part of what coordinated entry does also says that we may have in, in a single community, um, we may have two or three providers that are doing most of the sort of more intensive homeless assistance work, right? But then we have lots of other providers that may, may touch those clients in different ways, right? That, that we might have the library, right? We might have a police department, or we might have, these are folks that are on more the periphery. They're not, they're, they're sort of core mission as in homeless assistance, but they're a part of our community. Mm -hmm. And so part of what coordinated entry does is sort of say, hey, if you come across someone who's in a housing crisis, here's the referral you make. Um, and and there's more work to be done, for sure, in making sure folks are educated on where to make the referral. But in every community, we've said, here's how you make the referral. So that if you are sort of on the periphery, you know how to, in that moment, you know how to make the right referral. Um, as opposed to saying, here, why don't you try this place, this place, this place, or this place. You can say, no, go here. And they're going to get you connected. Um, and I think that that's, that's part of what coordinated entry is hopefully going to make those access points more clear for that sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Um, and then the last kind of thing that I'll just uh, throw throw at you here. It's been a lot. It's been great. <laughs> um, I really like this slide. I stole this from the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness, or USICH. Um, and I think we at DCF think about homelessness. I think Commissioner Schatz did a good job saying DCF serves a wide range of populations, not just families with children. But first and foremost in my mind is that um, homelessness, especially in the early childhood, has really devastating consequences. And um, we need to do better for families experiencing homelessness. So a person in the U.S. is most likely to experience homelessness in the first year of their life. Half of the children in shelter are under the age of six. 
I want to reiterate that that is true in Vermont also. Half of the children who are homeless in Vermont are under the age of six. Um, and even homelessness during pregnancy has been shown to be really harmful for children's development. So I think this is an area that um, is uh, a hard one to tackle, but housing instability, particularly with kids, with really young kids, has, has really devastating impacts for those kids moving forward and for those families. Um, and at the agency, we have a number of really specific strategies that we're approaching in terms of how we work better um, around or the, working with our early childhood partners and around homelessness. We can do more here, but um, we have sort of have some work groups that are working on specific things. Um, you know, we did some training with child care providers around how do you how do you get connected if you have a family in your child care um, who's maybe have a housing crisis. Do you know how to get them connected? Do you know some of the special resources that might be available for them, like um, like uh, subsidized child care? You know that they're categorically eligible for child care financial assistance if they're homeless. So. We, we need people to know about the resources available, and we, we put some effort behind doing that. Um, and then, I don't know, Ken, if you wanted to wrap it up here, or you want me to sort of focus on some of these pieces? I'm glad to. You can go ahead and start now, just fill in as needed. Okay. So, looking to the future. So, we really want to, I mentioned coordinated entry, because this is where a lot of our energy is going, to sort of make sure that we fully implement coordinated entry. Um, it's been on the ground for about a year. And uh, we want to get better in, in actually doing it and sort of fully, fully doing it. Um, HMIS is the way that all of the providers um, uh, track and manage the data around homelessness. So this, um, I can give you information around how long someone was in shelter, um, but that person in shelter was also maybe on the streets a little bit. They were also maybe in a motel. They were also maybe in this other program. And so HMIS is the way that we get the fuller picture of homelessness in the state, not just a shelter stay. And so implementing HMIS is, is sort of something that we are fully invested in. Um, we know that we need to strengthen our support services around helping people both find housing, um, which I talked about, and then keep housing, and those are two key pieces. Um, and we want to continue to expand community capacity uh, through GA investments, um, and then improve access to affordable housing. So those are some key areas at DCF. And if I may, so, the reality is, you know, we do have a complicated issue to address and there's complicated systems that are already in place to address them. This is where you as a, as a policy committee will also be asked by the appropriations committees uh, to review our budget at DCF and I look forward to those conversations because in terms of implementing these, uh, um, these strategies, we do it, of course, through our budget. And so what I would say to you is don't hesitate uh, to think about these issues and how we might better um, align our resources and our approaches uh, to address um, these issues along with other departments, other agencies, uh, and other community providers. So glad to answer questions about this, but it's challenging, it's hard because we do have, as you know, a finite amount of money in, in our budget, and we do need to think about how best to align uh, the money that we have available with the services that we want to implement. Right. Go ahead. Oh. I just want to make one final recommendation to you, Commissioner, is that you put a meteorologist on staff so they can better budget for your cold weather shelters for the next year. <laughs> the farmers on the farmers are like, oh, okay, that'll do, right? <laughs> that'll do. All right, well, thank you very much. It was um, and nice to meet you in the committee, um, Jeffrey, and we will, I'm sure, see you again. So. <laughs> Play in the chair and you need a break. Yeah, thank you for being back on um, So we have with us, well, they'll introduce themselves, give their titles, um, and then it kind of, I'm going to pop, pepper you with questions, of, you know, or, or ask for clarifications when I think <laughs> we've gotten into lingo. Um, but please join us. Um, you did you you were here for the introduction, so you know us all now. Yes. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Please. Okay. Well, for the record, I'm Gus Seward. I'm the director for the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. And hi, I'm uh, Jen Holler. I'm the policy director for BHCB. So we will also do this presentation together. Um, and just by way of introduction, 
I'll say that the Housing and Conservation Board was established in the mid-1980s uh, by the legislature, by your predecessors, um, at a time that the federal government had really retreated from housing, and I'll talk about it as an investment area, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, we're here mostly to talk about the theme you've been on all day, which is homelessness, uh, and we appreciate the opportunity to come back. But our fundamental role in this work is to provide capital dollars to support the rehabilitation and construction of housing of all types all over the state. And um, we'll talk specifically about the housing revenue bond and how that's contributing um, uh, to the work uh, that you're addressing today in homelessness. Um, but I would also say that to address the issue of homelessness, you need a healthy housing market for a variety of reasons. In many parts of the state, that's not what we have. Um, what's in front of you right now are two things. One is um, what's in the statute that enabled our creation. Uh, so we have a mission that encompasses housing and conservation. And the photo that you're looking at is, the, is an architect's rendering of what the site up at Burlington College would look like when build out is completed. And what's happened here, and this is what we call a dual goal project, is we have helped the city conserve and purchase 12 acres right on the lake for everybody to use. And a developer is going to build a 700 unit neighborhood with about um, 150 to 200 units <coughs> being very affordable housing, including some of those apartments that will be reserved for people who have experienced homelessness. So that's kind of from a statutory perspective a home run for us. Um, and it's great that we're going to build a neighborhood and this will help increase accessibility from the old north end to the lake. Uh, in a very positive way, so it meets all of the goals. Um, and I won't dwell on this slide, but this is what we've done cumulatively over 30 years in terms of housing and conservation. Um, I'll talk a bit more about AmeriCorps in a minute as it relates uh, to homelessness. Um, and as we go through this presentation, I guess I just want to say a couple things about homelessness in general, and I, and the, I have great respect <coughs> Uh, for Commissioner Schatz, the, the one thing that I hope I'd like to disagree with him on is his pessimism that we can solve this problem, uh, that we may not solve this problem, that we're just going to continue to care for it. And I say that from the perspective of somebody who, when I went to work at what is now called Capstone Community Action in 1977, we didn't have the Committee on Shelter, Temporary Shelter. We didn't have Good Samaritan Haven. We didn't have the Haven in Hartford. We didn't have Groundworks uh, Collaborative in Brattleboro. And that's because we didn't need a system of shelters to house Vermonters. So as you think about this problem, and we're mostly talking about how do we fix it for today, I guess I would say the bigger policy issue is how did we get here? Um, and I'm going to lay out three things that I think caused it. But if we didn't have homelessness writ large in the 1970s, not just in Vermont, but in the United States, I grew up. New York City, I went to D.C. in the 70s, and you didn't come get out of the metro and at Union Station and see the homeless everywhere. It was a, it was a different place. Three things happened. Uh, one is, um, in the 1980s, we really changed federal policy and we slashed the HUD budget. Big time. Uh, and that was one cause. Uh, housing experts debate this, but we also had deinstitutionalization, which I think, from a humane, humane Humanitarian perspective, very good thing. We used to house many hundreds of people at the state hospital and at the Brandon Training School. But and the promise was that money would follow people out of those institutions. And to some degree it did, but it didn't necessarily for housing in any kind of big way. And then the last thing that has really changed, I think, in our economy is what people earn and what the cost of housing is. And for those of us who have been fortunate um, you know, I bought a house in East Callison in 1978, my wife and I, and it cost us $26,000. Mm -hmm. We sold it about six years ago for around $200,000. Um, a young person getting out of college today, or a young couple, who have college debt, and if they have childcare expenses, mm -hmm. boy, that's a stretch. Mm -hmm. And in lots of parts of the state, $200,000 is at the very low end of where the market is, particularly in the Northwestern state. So there's something about our economy, about the whole issue of how we divide up and share income 
and how we deal with wealth that has really changed. I think we were a far less prosperous state in the 1970s, but we didn't have this problem. So I, I would just say this is a big problem, and as you think about it, think about that perspective of what, what how did all those things contribute to where we are in this issue today. The, the other thing I want to put forward um, is that an investment in housing, and we're certainly here to talk about how we can make be a vehicle for that investment, is actually going to save us money in the long term in two different ways. And we'll speak to this in some of the slides. It, but I believe that it can save money in other parts of the state budget, whether it's the GA budget, the corrections budget, um, health care costs, any kind of institutional costs. Certainly, if somebody is in a psychiatric facility for any length of time, that's a very expensive way for somebody to be housed. Um, but I think there's also growing evidence that about two years ago, uh, the legislature and with all the new members, I suggest you might want to have you back here, had a doctor from Children's Health Watch, Dr. Megan Sandel, come up and make a presentation. And I thought it was, uh, more and more there is data about what it costs in terms of our health. Not, so that, for me, this, for some people, this is just a fundamental moral issue, but I think for others, how do we pay for it? What are the dollars and cents to it? And I think there's a cost that we don't always account for, whether it's the cost of trying to educate a child who's been homeless and move from one school system to the next, cost of mental health care. All of those things are really costs that we need a better way to measure. And if we started to measure them, we might say that investing housing in housing is a really, really good thing. Um, so our role, um, we create and preserve housing for very low income folks up to moderate income folks. Um, we're the only place in the budget where you're directly putting capital dollars um, to build housing. Um, uh, you're supporting housing in some other ways. Uh, we are providing buildings that will permanently house people who've been homeless, who are part of our statute. It's what's called permanent affordability. We have worked with most of the shelter providers one way or another. Some of them don't even know it because we made a grant 20 years ago and the staff and the boards have changed over. But there's pretty much no shelter, shelter facility for the state that we haven't invested in. But the biggest part of our work has been in multifamily rental housing. Um, but we've also done single family home ownership as well, mobile home parks as well. We do a fair amount of training and technical assistance. We work through a network primarily of regional partners. Um, and Jen will talk in a moment about the policy work that she led to um, when she and other agencies hired a consultant who developed the roadmap to end homelessness. Um, there's clearly, as you've heard today, three parts to this problem. And one is having the housing available. And the problem of people getting rental assistance vouchers and then having landlords turn them away and having to turn those vouchers back in is a symbol of the shortage of housing. Um, they have other choices in the market, easier to manage, less stress on them, and they can charge higher rents. Um, a second piece uh, is certainly the services that are needed for housing. And beyond investing in the Housing and Conservation Board, I certainly would say to you, that if the Family Supportive Housing Program is working in seven districts in the state, it would be better for all of us if it worked in all 12 and maybe in some of the districts. We just had a meeting with AHS the other day, and uh, they reported to us that usage of GA programs, particularly up in Franklin County and in Rutland County, uh, maybe we need more support in those parts of the state. And certainly, uh, we need to get every dollar we can out of the feds for rental assistance. Um, you may need to look at investment in that program at the state level as well, as well as the contingency program at the department. And, uh, um, so with that, I'm going to turn it to Jen to go through the next few slides because she really led the effort on the roadmap. And, and then I'll talk some more. Yeah, before we go, just, just to finish off, just a, a, an historical point um, in terms of the what causes homelessness or what, or what can what doesn't help, I suppose, is this race is, what, 2011, 2010, 2011, the state lost close to 1,000 Section 8 vouchers from HUD 
and you know some of the numbers that jumped up by 12 or 13, 2012 or 2013, there was a correlation in numbers that that there were you know there were this many more families that were homeless, and you can't say they were homeless because they didn't get a, a Section 8 voucher, but there was a deficit which has only been partially replaced, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? Do you, do you, I mean, I, you're correct that there was a cutback. I can't remember the numbers of how much we lost when there was a big fight over the budget, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we netted out the loss of several hundred vouchers across the state, and that's not good for the people who depend on it. It's not good for the landlords uh, who are trying to do the right thing, and really depend on regular payment and a reasonable rent so they can meet their expenses. So that certainly is something that has always hurt us has been the absence of as active a federal partner as, as we would like. And some of the things that we heard about in Sarah Phillips, the Vermont rental um, vouchers, essentially the Vermont ones, those were created in the aftermath of having lost those that big chunk of vouchers with the thought that, well, maybe they'll turn over in 12 months. And, and so that th those are reactions to the to that programming that we've done here, uh, that, you know, on a policy level here, but that, the, that this building has done to try to um, <coughs> patch the holes and happen. Jen? So as Gus, um, as Gus described, uh, the Vermont Housing Conservation Board were um, kind of a quasi-public agency um, for the newer members, you're going to be hearing from an awful lot of folks over the course of the next few weeks. But we're sort of structured a little bit like VSAC or the Vermont Economic Development Authority, but our mission is really around affordable housing and land conservation. So fundamentally, we're a funder and we have grants and loans for affordable housing and then um, things on the conservation side of our, our mission. But we also do policy work. Um, and one component of that a couple of years ago was helping out um, with a, a study that was um, funded by the legislature take, to take a look at how the state is addressing homelessness and essentially to find out what's working well, what's not, what else do we need to do. Um, so a steering committee um, was set up and the Housing and Conservation Board, myself, and um, at, the, at that time was Angus Cheney, um, was at the Agency of Human Services, put together a steering committee and Sarah did a lot of work on that and Maura Collins was here earlier um, from VHFA participate as well. Um, but we wanted to get a set of outside eyes to come in and look at how Vermont's approaching this problem um, and to tell us essentially if we're on track or what we can do better. So it hired a national consultant over the course of about six months, a pretty intensive effort. And um, they ultimately came out with a report that um, highlighted these five recommendations here. And um, they highlighted what you've been hearing today is that a big part of the problem around homelessness is that there's um, there's an insufficient supply. There's just not enough affordable available homes um, for folks. Um, essentially, this consultant said, Vermont's on track, you guys are doing really well, you need to continue to do a few things. You've really got to address this this gap in your in your housing supply. And in large part that led um, that led to conversations in the building around doing a housing revenue bond. Um, so if you're interested in the uh, in the roadmap itself, I, I just when the screen was at a difference, it looks like Earhart has provided to you with that, and there's some good there's some good background in there. But it talks about the importance also of the supportive services. So for some folks, homelessness is just a, a like a stretch. I wouldn't say just, but is a stretch of bad luck. And if they can get back on their feet and get back rent paid for a little bit and stabilize, they'll be fine and on their way. And for other folks, it's really the result of a lot of chronic conditions and some really severe pretty serious challenges in their lives and they're gonna need some support services in order to be able to um, remain stably housed. And um, one of the recommendations of this, um, of the roadmap and the consultant was that we needed to ramp up the services as well. So I'm gonna um, um, talk about some, oh I should mention that all the uh, photos that you see are all um, pictures of housing um, that the state has invested in through VHCB. Um, so I'll give you a variety of the kinds of things we've done. I'm going to talk a little bit now about what we've done over the past few years with kind of our, our ongoing state funding. We get through the budget state funding for property transfer tax, and then we use that to leverage federal programs as well. So I'm going to show you a few examples of those to help give you a sense of what we can of what we do. So this one we've actually talked about in this committee before, but now it's done. So 
couldn't resist wanting to um, highlight it, but it's an entire new neighborhood in, in Rutland, mm -hmm. Forest, uh, formerly called Forest Park, now known as Hickory Street, and they, the community had a really terrific celebration around that um, this summer, and there are 78 brand new homes there, um, replacing some really substandard, distressed, um, I think they had a mold problem, you guys had a mold problem, they had some pretty serious mold problems down there too, um, but it now is new community space, play space, and there are a number of um, apartments that are specifically dedicated to the homeless um, there, so it's a pretty, it's a pretty great success. Um, while we're talking about Rutland, I'll follow up on something that Sarah Phillips mentioned a little bit earlier, and that is that um, as, a, as a result of the roadmap, and always we try to coordinate across state agencies and keep those lines of communication going, so we did just have a meeting with them, and we know that there is a high level of need in Rutland, um, and um, we have been working with folks down there to let them know that there's a pretty unique opportunity available right now with the housing revenue bond funds and really hoping they could come together. It looks like something is beginning to come together now with maybe um, an, a, a building identified, very early conversations of and feasibility work going on um, around potential um, uh, permanent housing, but for homeless um, individuals or smaller units. So we're very hopeful that that's going to come along. And, and Jen, the, this dedicate this, we've heard this several times today about dedicating home, uh, units to the homeless. This is the result of um, Governor Shumlin's directive, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, we've all, the industry has always focused on it, but he made a specific request or, or directive right. that X percentage of the housing mm -hmm. be dedicated? Well, there's actually two pieces to that. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about the executive order um, later, but you're exactly right, Dom. It's always been part of our mission and um, the Agency of Human Services and others to try to serve the homeless. That work was sort of accelerated um, a couple of years ago by um, first the executive order and then also with the availability of the housing revenue bond funds. Um, but there's also something um, known as the Qualified Allocation Plan. So it's going to get referred to as the QAP. But that governs the use of the federal housing tax credits, which are a big source of funding for a lot of the projects. We kind of are, BHTV's funding is often the seed funding, the first money in, and then that allows people to pull together the other resources. A big part of that is federal housing credits, and there was a, um, um, an incentive built into that uh, for folks who dedicate a certain, knowing that the challenges that were out there, there was an incentive built into that allocation plan um, for projects or developments that include a specific number of units specifically dedicated to the homeless. And when I say dedicated to the homeless, it means that they will make every attempt to first house someone who is homeless. What they won't do is keep, keep that unit empty um, for months on end if there's another eligible family that can move in. But next time there's a turnover first, is there a homeless mm -hmm individual or family that can use that unit. So that's what we mean when we say dedicated. I just wanted to add that I live um, across the street from the entrance of Hickory Street um, development. And I have to say, what a difference. What a difference it has made. I've met many of the neighbors there. They are happy. Um, they have a wonderful community garden there in the summer. Um, it's it's a great place. I usually take a walk around there. Um, it's it's a great imp improvement, and I hope we see many more. <laughs> okay. I, I'm just going to add one point to um, th this discussion, which is we work primarily, not exclusively, but primarily with a network of about uh, nine mm -hmm. regional nonprofit organizations. We're very mission driven. A couple of statewide groups. Often there are partnerships with the private sector as well. Um, and what we found on a statewide basis when we look at what Jen referred to as tax credit housing is Vermont is serving among the very highest numbers of extremely low income people in the country as a percentage of who moves into this housing. And we think that that's because they're very mission driven. They want to do the partnerships with the homeless service providers with other social service providers. And um, so I think one could argue also that what that network is doing it, it, by focusing in that way is preventing folks from being homeless as well. Yeah. Yes. 
And that network of um, that network of regional nonprofits include the Champlain. I mean, these will, names will be familiar to the Champlain Housing Trust, Twin Pines Housing Trust, Addison County Community Trust, Downstreet Housing. I'm looking around the table. Memorial <laughs> Housing <laughs> Partnership, Downstreet again, and, and, and the Champlain um, Housing Trust. But Downstreet Housing and Community Development um, completed a project just a couple weeks ago that um, has been really exciting. I wanted to show that to you. This was um, funding that was provided to them a few years ago. It's the French Block, it's right across from City Hall, um, right down here on Main Street on Montpelier. The upper floors had been vacant for 37 years. They were in terrible, terrible shape. Seven. Oh, I said since, I, I meant to say since 1937. <laughs> so, thank wow. you. Um, a number of private developers had taken a look at it and just ultimately had to walk away because the challenge was too great. Um, um, but now it's 18 mixed income um, apartments. So some considered affordable, some that are just offered at market rates, and five are specifically dedicated to um, to homeless folks. And it's been a, it's been a terrific, um, a terrific uh, historic preservation and community revitalization project as well. Um, part of what VHCB does is help provide funding for emergency shelters too. Um, and this is an example of one, it's the Good Samaritan Haven in Barrie. Um, going up to, um, up to South Burlington, this is an example of what is known as permanent supportive housing. So this is a former motel, it's known as Beacon Apartments. Um, and it serves medically vulnerable and chronically homeless individuals, people who are really, really challenged and um, need a lot of supports around them. The Champlain Housing Trust partnered with the UVM Medical Center because these are folks that were often showing up in their emergency rooms. Um, and then they would discharge them and there was no way that they could really get better if they're living, um, living in the woods and in tents and, or bouncing from shelter to shelter. So um, that's up and running now. It, it provides 20 homes. Um, the block on the right is data that's collected um, and has been shared and since been updated. I don't have the most recent version that shows the direct cost to the medical center of um, the 28 patients that live here. And you can see, so the bar on the far left was 90 and 100 days prior to them moving in and then 60 to 90 days, and then zero to 60 days. And so um, you can see that that was pretty expensive. The line in the middle, then it's like the, the tallest bar is how much the direct costs were right after they moved in is because that's a play, they're playing catch up. They're getting lots of care that they, that they hadn't been getting, and then, the, and then the costs drop way off. So people are getting uh, not only their housing, but their health stabilized. And that impacts the state's finances as well. Is there something you want to add there? Well, I, I guess I would just say that the health uh, UVM Medical Center is actually now investing as part of not their charitable budget, but their medical budget in housing because they've found that it's saving the money. I know there was a report on public radio not long ago about people who are homeless who are caught in emergency rooms and the stress that that causes the nurses mm -hmm. and the other mm -hmm. staff, but also the expense of it. So as I said when we opened the presentation, um, we think that there are, that if you did enough accounting, you would see cost savings, not just in the state's budget, but in our health care systems as well, uh, by providing people housing. And when you think of what it is, for instance, to be a diabetic and not have a refrigerator to keep your medicine in, maybe that's not a big problem this time of year, but if, if you're living outside in the summer and you don't have a refrigeration, things are going to go wrong. And I think it was because the head of the uh, emergency center saw the savings once Harbor Place opened, so on the medical center said, oh, there's a smarter way for us to do this than just having people run in and out of our emergency rooms. And, uh, and so I, I think that's been a great breakthrough and, and one of the things that I, I think this community will spend some time on. Yeah, we, we will hear from this UVM center there on the list of, yeah. to talk about not only um, this, but um, we heard very briefly about the Bel Air mm -hmm. yes. as a transitional housing or pre-housing. You know, so, so just the numbers are phenomenal. Just the number drop-offs are, are phenomenal. Um, we, we have also, one of our staff did some interviewing with some of the residents here, and we have a video that we'd be happy to share with the committee. So this 
next slide is a, another way in which um, the state's investments through VHCB are helping um, keep people from um, being homeless. Um, this is transitional housing for people that are coming out of corrections or have um, mm -hmm. other examples of ones that we help fund around the state. And so the housing, the, the regional housing nonprofits or, or other groups um, own and maintain and manage the housing and then they have a contract with the Department of Corrections for a certain number of beds. Um, and the one up on the right is, gosh, we're talking a lot about Rutland, but that's Mandela House in Rutland, women who were coming out of, um, out of incarceration, and a couple examples of dismissed houses, one's I believe in Burlington and the other maybe in Hartford, um, of, uh, of folks who are able to stay there until they can figure out how to get back on their feet and move into permanent housing. Um, so in my mind, that's, that's the best outcome, but there's also a financial implication, and that is that um, the um, cost of, for the Department of Corrections of uh, helping uh, paying for those beds is so much lower than what it would cost them if they were um, still in prison, um, that it saves uh, about $3.7 million a year in the state budget. Okay, so um, this is another facility we developed with the Committee on Temporary Shelter and Housing in Vermont. It's in Winooski. Um, uh, and it is for homeless veterans. And that's a pretty easy place for people to agree. Everybody ought to ante in and help. Um, when we had the opening, it was, I think, a, among them, probably the most emotional experience I've had in my many years doing this work. Uh, and both the VFW and the region and the present, not just local chapters, but national folks, because it is such an important project. But the other thing I'd say, and this is a completely different issue that this committee should be focused on, and your colleagues as they think about Act 250, uh, is, what's the, is a question of what density means. And so when you look at this building, which is a tall building, uh, but it's on one-fifth of an acre, this is what 125 units an acre looks like. So we can do density tomorrow. Shouldn't do it every place, but a place like Winooski is about two blocks from the downtown. It works just fine. Um, are there any other projects in the works for veterans in these agencies right now, or is that just one in this kind of a pilot program? Um, that one has been done and <laughs> successful. There is another facility in Northfield that's really been run on community energy. And, and there. It's been a terrific uh, partnership, um, and I think that there's uh, a desire to do more, but there hasn't been uh, the same call to funding and the same level of concentration of need that I'm aware of. But if somebody brought us a proposal, I can tell you we'd be excited to work on it. So, you know, we respond to proposals, and I guess one of the things we should have said at the outset. Our job is to be responsive to your constituents. So if there's a need in any of your regions that you think isn't being met, um, make our phone ring. Uh, the reason we're having a conversation in Rutland about a facility for the homeless is because AHS told us last spring, real problem, and uh, so we can be the group of people that all got together and now a building is under option. I don't think as Jen said, it's at the early stages. Mm -hmm. Uh, but um, we are happy to, you know your communities better than we do, and we're happy to hear what you think the needs are and try to make sure they get the best. Thank you. Um, so um, just to give you other senses of the work we're doing, and, and this says permanent affordability as a headline. When we were established back in the 80s, um, there were two developments. One was in Essex, the other in Moortown, that had been subsidized by the federal government for its development. It's 100 units in Essex, great school system, 30-some uh, units in Moortown, and owned by the same guy. And he went into the Farmers Home Administration, is what it was called back then, and played by the rules, and he prepaid his mortgage. He then doubled the rents in, in Essex, and a year later, every family that depended on that housing had, had to relocate because they couldn't afford it. Turned the Moortown project into condominiums, uh, and again, everybody was displaced. So the, the view that was established in our legislation was when we invest the state's funds, it should not be 
something that's going to be approval for five mm -hmm. years or ten years or even twenty years, uh, which is what the old Section Eight contracts require. It, it ought to be a permanent investment. That's part of the reason that we work with nonprofits. Is you know, if you're a private developer, you really want to make your money both on the front end and the back end. And we're saying as a policy matter, we don't want you to displace people on the back end. Uh, we've begun to work very regularly and talk about this if we come back into the committee to do an overview uh, on a lot of partnerships between the private sector and the nonprofit sector. Uh, there's a big project going on in South Burlington and we're coming out. Um, that's very much that kind of a partnership. Um, two projects here. One is a group uh, Habitat for Humanity celebrating the groundbreaking of the house, but it was a bad day, so they did it indoors with a model. We um, <laughs> I've uh, done about, I think we're up to 125 homes across the state with Habitat, and they're knocking out about seven houses a year. Faith-based folks from all over the state getting together, lots of sweat equity. Mm -hmm. People they choose as homeowners have to put in a certain number of hours to help build the house, and it's the most affordable kind of home ownership we can get. Mm -hmm. uh, the building on the right is the Swanton School, and it was vacant, I think, for about a decade before it was occupied. And it's I haven't been there probably in 10 years, but I think it's become really good senior housing. It, it looks essentially the same. Mm -hmm. but it's, it's a valuable, uh, very valuable to the community. And it seems to be run well. I don't hear complaints from anyone. Okay. <laughs> it's a good sign, right? Okay. Okay. Yes. Let us <laughs> know if that changes. Sign. Okay, I will. Yeah. Um, Couple more projects, and uh, you know, one of the themes that I've heard uh, from the governor and the speaker and the president pro tem is we really need to pay attention to rural Vermont. Um, so on the right is a building that was done uh, in the 90s by the Lamoille Housing Partnership in Hardwick, uh, and there's been a fair amount of work done on the main street there. On the left is um, is a building in Townsend, and uh, that's where Grace Cottage Hospital is. Uh, which is a federally qualified health center. And um, a lot of people came together, including one of our former board members, um, former Secretary of Agriculture, Roger Albee, because uh, they wanted to make sure people in their community could age there and have a place to go. Um, and uh, it's mixed income. His mom was one of the residents. Some of you know Pat Moulton, and some of you who are older might remember Big Al Moulton, and Big Al and his wife, spent their final years in this facility in Townsend. Um, and it's been a great success and a great partnership with the health center. Um, and one of the very first projects that we used modern with heat to heat. Um, so uh, the chair raised the question of the um, governor's executive order uh, a few minutes ago. And I just wanted to provide this overview of uh, how many folks who've been homeless, and that's according to a federal definition, uh, have been housed by our partners. And, but I think what was most remarkable in this last year is that there were 1,100 turnovers over the, out of the 6,000 apartments, and 28% um, went to people who had been experiencing homelessness. I think there are more people who were, uh, who were not counted in that number, but were, for instance, if you're doubled up, with family or friends, you don't count as homeless under the federal definition. Um, so I think the number of people who are actually significantly at risk for not having housing is higher than that. Um, and this really is, this work again is, is only possible because of partnerships uh, with local providers who are supported by the agency of human services. And without that, I think it gets to your comments earlier about whether you're a for-profit landlord or a non-profit landlord, if you have a bad tenant and things don't work and an apartment gets wrecked and you have to go for an eviction, it costs an awful lot of money. And that, I think, is one of the reasons we have people who kind of fall into the slumlord category. I mean, they're slumlords. They should be strung up, in my opinion. But then there are people who own property who have just gone through a series of tenants um, where you have a certain amount of um, destruction that happens or non-caring, and you go in and, and, uh, and you, you fix it. You 
make it presentable so that people have good housing and get somebody up. And it, it can cycle. Why I mentioned pathways, I wanted to know if they still are doing that, is that it takes, I think it's a great program because it gives landlords a security mm -hmm. that they're not just going to be left holding the bag, so to speak. With, with, um, it makes everybody accountable and there's responsibility to go around because as a, as a landlord, you've got responsibility. You have to keep the place up as well. But mm -hmm. I think if that were more widespread, that might very well release apartments well, I, to ease mm, part we, of the rental problem. I think we agreed, and I would agree with what Sarah said to you earlier, we think Pathways is a valuable program, as is the family supportive housing program mm -hmm. that you've funded in seven districts, and we hope we'll get expanded beyond that to the rest of the state. So I think those levels of supports are just absolutely critical for the most vulnerable among our fellow citizens in the country. Yeah. So I think we have a lot of common ground. Can I just say something about, the, about the executive order slide? So um, uh, one way to think about this is that the 15, the goal of 15% was applied to everybody who had received public. So anybody who gets public money, whether it's from DHCB or one of the federal programs that flows through the state, um, for a project, they, in their existing portfolio, so the properties or the um, apartments that they already own and manage, we need to try to meet that that 15%. So it's a way of looking back at um, uh, the investments that the state had already made. I mean, there's, you know, you know here you'll see there's about 6,000 apartments that they're, and those, those because they're permanently affordable, those are going to help many, many generations of families and um, and people turning over. So those assets, those investments are always there. But at the same time, it is it is honestly challenging the people who own and manage the properties a little bit in some instances. Um, and some of the larger groups have the ability um, to invest in more supportive or like resident service coordinators. And But some of the smaller organizations just don't have that ability. And it can be a little bit challenging for they're a different kind of landowner, but it can be kind of challenging when the services aren't there to support <coughs> folks. So, is this in the examples in Burlington and in, in Rutland and Montpelier that we saw? Is this 15% rule kind of how you work with the developers of those properties? They, and then how do you keep affordability affordable in well, these, these, those examples? Okay, so uh, we should probably be a little bit more precise in some of our language. Um, so the executive order asks us and asks the HFA and asks the Department of Housing and Community Development, if you're going to give money to somebody that they commit that 15% of their housing be made available to people who are homeless. And they do that by asking them to enter into a memorandum of understanding with a service provider. It might be a homeless service organization like the Committee on Temporary Shelter, it might be Women Helping Battered Women, it might be any number, it might be a community action agency. That's what we ask them to do, but we understand they need the services in order to serve that population. Um, we define affordability generally as developing a rent schedule where some percentage of the apartments in a, in a rental development will be affordable to somebody at 50% of median. We also ask our partners to go to the various local housing authorities and the state housing authority or the state's programs to get rental assistance for the tenants. And sometimes they will bring somebody in without that rental assistance but work to get them on the waiting list so that they can work their way up if they have a low enough income that they can't swing it. You will see people in the units that we fund who are paying, using 40, their incomes are low enough that they're using 40 and 50% of their income for rent. So we don't get to that federal standard without rental assistance for really low income people without a subsidy. But we are getting rents made available that are below market rents. Thank you. And Representative Gamache, just on Pathways, there, I believe January 31st is Pathways Day. Down in the card room, and we'll have them up here. So, yeah, they're up there. Awesome, they do awesome work.
Okay, so to get to the bond, um, the bond was just passed um, 18 months ago, uh, January 27th, um, 2017. Um, the sale exceeded the expectation, so those of you who were here to support it, it was expected to raise 35 million. We actually we hit the market at just the right time. It was just under 37 million dollars. Um, we have um, committed, uh, we've marketed it as a sustainability bond uh, because of the board's track record of environmental stewardship, both in our conservation work and our smart growth philosophy toward where we built housing and the energy standards we employ for the buildings that people bring us. Uh, so that helped improve the return uh, from the bondholders. We've so far committed 22 million, just under 22 million dollars. We're going to consider a couple more projects next week. Um, so far, um, we've funded 468 homes around the state, some home ownership. Most of it is rental housing. Um, it's in 15 different communities, eight different counties. The first 86 homes are already occupied in three towns. Um, there's about 240 homes under construction today all over the state. But that first picture I showed you uh, up here is Manchester, Vermont, where we're, there's a 12-unit condominium project. And when the construction is done, it'll be a 20-unit condominium project. And people will be able to get a three-bedroom home in Manchester for that $180,000. So there, that's a, that's a great deal. Um, the build the picture you're looking at is in South Burlington, and it is part of a city center development. And I talked a few minutes ago about public-private partnerships. This is a turnkey between a couple developers uh, called Chris Snyder of Snyder Homes and Ken Braverman, and they have a master plan to build 700 homes in what would be South Burlington City Center. Right next to this building, the community is voting to put in a library and city, new city hall. Behind it is a local school down the street with broken ground on a 60-unit building, and the developers are going to do market housing. Mm -hmm. the rest of the voted. Time. We did it. Yes. And that voting, we voted it. Oh, we approved it. The libraries. So anyway, C30, <coughs> this is among the units that have been occupied already. Uh, we had a great, great opening a few a couple months ago now. Um, the bond asked us to make sure 25% of the housing would be available for the lowest income Vermonters and 25% at above 80% of median, but below 120, which is something we haven't been able to do with just because our funding has been too low to serve that into the market until the bond. So we're working and we're on track, track to move those goals. Uh, this is, the next couple projects are not yet under construction, but we've provided funding and assuming they get the rest of their financing together, we'll break down in Virgins um, this spring or early summer. Um, but this one is actually under construction. This is in Hartford, 30 unit development that uh, will be built uh, by late fall and occupied all next year. Uh, this is due to start in April. This is downtown Springfield. You know where the movie theater is. This is kind of catty corner to cross from it. Commercial space has been vacant for at least a decade. Uh, local economic development group has agreed to master lease the commercial space. There are going to be four apartments for folks who are homeless, homeless youth uh, in the building. Um, this is Putney Landing. This is, again, one of the buildings that has been occupied. And there are uh, 16 kids who call it home. And again, uh, two apartments dedicated to the homeless at this site. And there's an adjacent, not an adjacent site, but another site in town that's also been developed that is also housing some people who are homeless in an old historic building. Uh, this is a project that we hope will get the rest of its finance, and we just did the finance it this fall and be under construction next summer um, in Shaftesbury, just over the line to, from North Bennington, uh, which is one of those schools that has a really positive reputation. And we had, about 10 years ago, done some conservation work, and there'll be a path from the site to Lake Pan and the Lake Pan recreation area. So it'll be a great place for kids to be able to grow up. Um, and then this is a development in um, 
Brattleboro uh, that is a collaboration between the Wyndham Windsor Housing Trust and the Groundworks Collaborative. Um, we heard from Deb Zach this morning a little bit about this. Yeah. And it is again one of the buildings that was occupied. And if you had seen the buildings uh, before construction, you would have um, shaken your head and said, could this really be a good place to be? people live, but they had a great architect and a great design team, and they reoriented the site, they built a community building in the middle of it, and though they are micro-apartments, um, the feeling is really nice, they well designed. And this one received an award from a, a National Association of Community Development Agencies, in part because of its, um, um, it's a potential model, you know, using an old roadside motel, you know, the travel industry has changed a lot, and this is a way that um, providing supportive housing in this really small community, I mean, Brattleboro is small compared to <laughs> um, nationally, and they saw that as a potential model, and it was recognized in that way. And this was a project at 30% of median, which is, yes. as, which, you know, a lot of them are 60 to 80, and so this is, I mean, that's the other part of this that's outstanding, is that it's for the, for the lowest level of, of median income. Um, so this is a building owned by the Clara Martin Center in Randolph, which was the qualified you know, health agency for that part of the state. It's been vacant for about a decade, and this will be four homes for the home, for homeless <coughs> folks with um, chronic or persistent mental illness, and it should be under construction now or very soon and within the next year, uh, and within all the services in the community. So briefly, we are on track to meet the goals of the revenue bond. Um, I will say that when the next fiscal year begins, unless you do something different, we'll actually have less money because we'll have spent so much of it down than we've had the last two years. Um, the majority will serve families, and uh, Almost every development, but one or two have units that are dedicated to serve the homeless. In a few cases, the dedication will be off-site rather than on-site. Um, we are seeing, because of the bond, a huge amount of, it's sparking a lot of ideas and a lot of proposals. So uh, we think we'll have way more demand than we can meet next year. Um, and we're seeing more mixed income development, which we think overall is a good, healthy thing. One of the things housing economists will tell you is when people, and this makes a fair amount of just common sense to me, when people with more means are in the rental market, they haven't, they're not buying homes, and they're competing with people who have less means, who wins that competition? Who will the landlord take a chance on? The person with a good credit score and good references, or the person with a bad credit score and maybe not such good references? So, um, while I think we have heard from legislators in the past that we should focus only on the most vulnerable, I think that there is some wisdom to the governor's desire that we serve this wider spectrum and we have the resources uh, to do it. Um, we have some challenges um, continuing, and I'd say in terms of the question of today, in terms of serving the homeless, um, we have a limited amount of rental assistance in Vermont, we have a limited level of support services. So we need both those things along with the housing dollars to do, to meet the need. Uh, and as I've already indicated, we will, uh, we have also a problem in our economy where wages just don't keep up with the cost of housing. Um, and that's a fundamental one that I know this committee wrestles with in other ways. And then finally, we will um, spend the bond down and whether we can keep up the momentum will be up to all of you and the other body and the other. So I think that. Um, there's just a, yeah, just a couple more. Just to loop back to uh, something that Sarah was saying. I mean, just to reinforce how important this is. I mean, why it, why it really matters in our uh, homelessness um, and particularly the impact on kids. So the MacArthur Foundation did some uh, a particular body of work um, around how on lack of stable housing impacts kids and their upward mobility. So clearly the research shows um, that safe and affordable housing is a launching pad to folks in, in terms of um, and, and just on a brighter future. This picture here is a, is a group of kids who are at daycare center that's next to an affordable housing project over on Berry Street owned by Downstreet Housing and Community Development. Um, Gus has heard me say this 
as many times. I love this picture because they're they're all really excited and they're holding their scissors in the safety position. <laughs> <laughs> um, this uh, this young father is uh, pictured outside his home in Brandon and the Brandon Training School. A number of buildings there were converted to affordable mm -hmm. housing um, and are owned and managed by the Housing Trust of Rockland County. But here's some really pretty powerful quotes that sort of extract from these various research papers and studies um, that the MacArthur Foundation um, does. So if you're worried about health, if you're worried about education outcomes, or if you're um, worried about um, children's livelihood, it's all impacted, severely impacted by a lack of stable housing. Um, so one, one broader thing I, I, I'd like to add about the housing revenue bond, I mean, You've heard a lot about the challenge of homelessness today. The legislature did a fantastic thing um, 18 months ago. It passed a, um, a housing revenue bond, one of the largest investments in the state's history of affordable housing. Why are there still homeless people on the street? I mean, part of that is lead time. Um, the, um, the bond is up and running, and the projects are going quickly. But out of that, just right now, 86 homes are now occupied. Hopefully by the end of the year or early next year, there'll be another 200 in 50, and at that point, we really hope to be able to see the impacted communities and some of those numbers coming back down, but it's just a little too early yet for the impact or the benefit of the bonds to be felt in, um, in communities. Um, so just wanted to, it, it takes a little while for it to get out there and mm -hmm. get going. So um, this is all great stuff, great news, but um, what's, con what's of concern to me is that from taking testimony last year in Human Services, the number of homeless people in Vermont is almost exactly the same as it was last year. How do we explain that? What, what, what do we attribute that to? I'm going to go ahead. No, go ahead. If you would like to make a call, please hang up and try again. That's oh, okay. <laughs> well, I'm going, to, I'm going to say two things. One is that uh, the not, who is homeless is a dynamic, and the number may be consistent but who becomes homeless is a, a changing number. So if, if the point, point in time count is, what, 1,200? 1,200. It's not the same 1,200 people. And it, it is captured at a, at a particular point. Um, the second thing is that the housing market is dynamic and tight. And what we are seeing, uh, maybe not in your district, but in some di some parts of the state, is that rents are continuing to go up significantly, mm -hmm. a and so the stress and strain and who becomes homeless, uh, you know, when you have job loss, which affects some communities, um, you know. So if we're looking at Wyndham County, for instance, between the changes at Yankee and the printing company that went out of business and so on, there are. The economy has changed there and not for the better. So I think all of those things can contribute to the fact that we are, to some degree, stuck in a, in a particular place. The last thing, you know, we actually have more housing than we had a generation ago, but family size, you know, we used to think of family of four as the typical uh, size family. Family size has shrunk down to about 2.1 on average. So. Because family size, whether it's because of age, because of divorce, whatever the re social reasons are, we need more homes to house the, the population of Vermont. Hmm. This is my second week in the legislature, so um, I, I, the, the Act 250 is being revisited now, and there's a paper I read, and there was a part of changing the focus development to more centralized downtown, if I understood that correctly. If that moves forward, would that impact your work and these examples you've given us? Would, would you have to focus more on building up downtowns, or would that matter to you? Well, we already have what we think of as smart growth criteria for where we will build. So it was never our goal, and if you think about our mission, which is also to conserve the Vermont countryside, to build in the farm fields of Vermont. It was really to build where there is infrastructure, where there's water and sewer. We have been in some rural communities and had to, that don't have, for instance, public sewer system. The village of Rotten is one where we 
did a housing project that, um, where all the systems are on site. That's very expensive, but I don't see that as changing our work. I think we want to help strengthen our village centers. We've got some key downtown projects ahead of us, one in downtown St. Johnsbury. We're working on a very big economic development and housing project in Bennington. Uh, we have a proposal in front of us next week for downtown St. Albans. Um, and I think we want to build where it is convenient to public transit. I think we want to build where it's convenient to services, whether it's shopping or social services or medical services. So um, our, it, it actually strengthens our conservation mission to not be sprawling out. I think what comes from the Act 250 work is still to be determined right now. If you're in a priority housing area, you get a pass on Act 250 if you're building affordable housing. And I would say that that's a good policy overall. If it becomes any housing can be built, I worry that perhaps we'll have increased the value and the opportunity and maybe we won't build affordable housing. <laughs> Thank you for sticking with us at this time. <laughs> I hope we don't. Yeah. yeah, thank you for sticking with us. <laughs> um, it's, um, no, it's, this is, you know, it's only a start, but it's a good foundation of information. And um, I appreciate you, you know, just focusing in on the, mostly on the homelessness issue and what, you know, what the HCB is contributing to. Working with that. So Can I make one announcement before we break? Sure. So um, going to what Gus had I mentioned about uh, price of housing going up um, much quicker than uh, wages. Um, tonight from 4.30 to 5.30, Public Assets Institute will be uh, giving a, uh, a presentation on the economy and, and the state budget. It will be presented again on next Tuesday the 22nd from 9 to 10 a.m. and that's in room 10. So you might want to think about um, going and hearing what they have to say. It, it's, it's very informative, it's very reliable, and um, it certainly ties into what we've heard today in some respects. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And committee, um, <coughs> we are done for today.